The story began with a village descended into chaos, with flames swiftly consuming every house. The barbarians are mercilessly slaughtering the villagers, sparing no one in their quest to leave no survivors. The terrified people are desperately fleeing to save their lives. Amidst the frantic rush of others fleeing, one man stood his ground, defiantly wielding a weapon pointed towards the approaching barbarians. A distraught woman, cradling her child, wept inconsolably, pleading with the barbarian to spare both her life and that of her innocent child. Despite the woman's desperate pleas, the barbarian appeared unmoved, showing no signs of mercy as it relentlessly continued to brandish its weapon. Upon hearing the barbarian sarcastically contemplate whether he should spare her, fear gripped the woman, intensifying the harrowing situation. As the barbarian prepared to swing its weapon towards the woman, a sudden intervention swiftly positioned itself between them, catching the barbarian off guard and leaving it visibly surprised. Out of nowhere, the barbarian's hands, along with half of his arm and weapon, were swiftly severed and fell to the ground. The abrupt and rapid severing of the barbarian's hands, coupled with half of his arm, left him visibly stunned. If you are new to our channel, make sure you hit the subscribe for Manvo recaps and make sure to leave a comment if you want the next part. A piercing scream escaped the man as he realized his arm had been ruthlessly severed. Meanwhile, the mysterious figure lurking in the shadows prepared to deliver a devastating blow, seemingly intent on annihilating him completely. Fueled by rage, the barbarian, despite the loss of a limb, defiantly attempted to engage in a desperate fight against the man who had thwarted his initial attack. Yet, with an astonishing display of speed and precision, the mysterious figure swiftly executed a decisive move, completely beheading the enraged barbarian, putting an abrupt end to the confrontation. It is widely known among the barbarians that encountering this mysterious figure leads to certain death, a belief that has spread fear and caution among those who share tales of the enigmatic and lethal adversary. A spectral figure, known as the Grim Reaper, is rumored to haunt the village, stealthily navigating its streets and engaging in fierce battles with the barbarians, casting an ominous shadow over their ruthless pursuits. He bears the name Gwai, derived from the fusion of Gwishin meaning ghost, and the young Hanya for shadow. Essentially, he is known as the Ghost Shadow. Following the tragic incident in the village, chaos reigned supreme, with the streets littered with the lifeless bodies of the deceased. Amidst the unsettling aftermath, the people who survived wandered about, exchanging hushed whispers and gossip about the ghostly presence known as the Ghost Shadow. The old man didn't see the point in the Ghost Shadow helping them. He thought they were defenseless against the barbarians who had attacked and looted the village, and a month felt like a very long time to wait for any help. For the people in the northern region, every day feels like hell. They're well aware that when winter arrives, their choices narrow down to either freezing to death or falling victim to the merciless hands of the barbarians. Rumors circulate among the servants, debating whether their ruler is truly aware of their dire situation or if he's merely pretending to be ignorant of their struggles. While strolling through the streets, a boy seemed on the verge of throwing a punch at one of the majesty's men. However, his attempt was swiftly thwarted as one of the men intervened, putting a stop to his impending attack. In response, the man swiftly retaliated by delivering a forceful kick to the boy. The man sternly questioned the boy, demanding to know what he thought he was doing and whether he desired death as a consequence. The man who had been attacked looked visibly surprised by the unexpected aggression. Observing the boy, a sense of concern washed over the man's expression. The boy, expressing his frustration, confronted the man, accusing him of hypocrisy and insincere concern. He pointed out that they only seemed to show care after the barbarian attack had already wreaked havoc. The man's guard, feeling disrespected, harbored the intention of silencing the boy by cutting his tongue. But the man intervened, preventing any further escalation. The man reassured that it was all right, acknowledging that the child's feelings were valid and not his fault for perceiving the situation in that manner. The boy's sister approached and offered an apology to their lord, while the boy attempted to resist and maintain his stance. An elderly man standing beside the man spoke up, revealing that the children had lost their entire family to the barbarians seven years ago. He explained that despite the passage of time since the attack, the children had struggled to adjust and were often seen wandering aimlessly, unable to find their footing. The man was taken aback and felt a deep concern upon learning about the children's tragic history and the ongoing challenges they faced in coping with the aftermath of the barbarian attack. The old man further drew attention to a grieving woman in the scene revealing that she had become a widow just last year, losing her husband to the barbarian. Additionally, she also lost his son to the barbarians. The old man continued, sharing the heart-wrenching details that the two children in tears had lost their mother two summers ago, and with the recent barbarian attack, they now found themselves orphaned after losing their father as well. He added that this kind of situation happens to many children whenever barbarians attack a village, 
The Lord was surprised, realizing that the situation was much more serious than he had initially believed. Realizing the gravity of the situation, they understood the need to hasten their efforts and locate Ghost Shadow. Moreover, a notice was posted on the village wall for everyone to see. However, they were left in the dark about its contents since they lacked the ability to read the notice. The villagers were making efforts to identify someone who could read the characters, as the nation had posted a notice for a change. Unfortunately, the people were in the dark, unable to comprehend the message. One man attempted to read the notice, and another corrected him, stating that it was Guiyang. He announced that the king was searching for the ghost's shadow, and mentioned that a jade plaque would be bestowed upon finding him. Continuing, he explained that the notice revealed the formation of royal bodyguards, and the king intended to transfer the ghost's shadow to that position. The villagers were taken aback by the news, realizing that the jade plaque represented an opportunity to receive rewards without having to undergo any tests. The man informed the villagers that Guiyang was quite renowned in the northern region and inquired if any of them had any information about him. The villagers acknowledged that there were rumors about Guiyang, but they questioned whether anyone had actually seen him in person. One of the villagers shared that Granny Jang claimed to have seen Guiyang and described him as being built over two chiaks. However, another villager disagreed, stating that they heard he looked like a hunchbacked monster. The woman said that Guiyang is a mysterious man. Some think he's strong, while others say he looks like a monster. She heard rumors that he fights and kills people, but it's unclear if he only targets barbarians. The man pondered that there was no reliable information available about Guiyang. A man standing behind the villagers listened silently, absorbing the conversation without uttering a word. He silently listened and observed, paying close attention to what the man was saying. Furthermore, he proceeded to a hut. He then lowered his belongings to the ground. Afterwards, he swiftly took a seat with a table in front of him. A woman approached and inquired about his order. He expressed his desire for a bowl of tach and unrefined rice wine. Suddenly, he was pleasantly surprised when another man abruptly took a seat across from him and instructed the woman to bring two bowls instead. The man flashed a friendly smile and inquired if sharing the table with him would be acceptable. Promptly, he pointed out the numerous empty tables available. However, the other man insisted that this particular spot was the only place he wanted to sit. Curious, he inquired if the man had any specific business with him. Suddenly, he was taken aback when the man blurted out the name Guiyang. While the man took the rice wine from the woman, she was stunned when he casually revealed that he was Guiyang. The woman served the rice wine, visibly anxious. Meanwhile, he questioned the man, asking why he thought he was Guiyang. While pouring the wine, the man mentioned that he had seen him about a year ago, although the memory was somewhat vague. A year ago, barbarians had raided the village, causing destruction, killing, and spreading chaos. The man, who was also a victim, lay helplessly on the ground, his eyes barely open, bearing witness to the devastation around him. In his blurry vision, he claimed to have seen Guiyang and asserted that Guiyang had saved him during that tumultuous time. However, Guiyang denied being the one who had saved him, expressing the belief that there might be a case of mistaken identity. Undeterred, the man continued speaking as he offered Guiyang the wine. He was stunned when the man shared a saying that suggested those who had taken lives carried the vengeful spirits of their victims with them wherever they went. As he sipped the wine, the man mentioned that he had heard from his father about the selection process for his majesty's bodyguards this time. Guiyang was taken aback when the man revealed that the goal this time was to pursue the subjugation of barbarians in the northern region, with a special force organized directly by the king himself. Guiyang inquired about the certainty of this information, and the man affirmed it as a hard fact. The man further revealed that he, too, had dedicated himself to the cause of subjugating the barbarians after losing his mother to them the previous year. The man acknowledged the countless rumors surrounding Guiyang's alleged slaughter of the barbarians, but insisted that Guiyang must have his own personal grudge and reasons for doing so. The man then proposed the idea of walking on a path together where they run the barbarians' bloodline and asked Guiyang for his thoughts on the matter. As the proposal was made, Guiyang remained silent, contemplating the proposition. The man then introduced himself as Teal from the tea family. Furthermore, Guiyang proceeded to drink his rice wine. After finishing the rice wine, he lowered the bowl. He then told Teal that following him might even lead to death. However, if Teal was willing, he expressed his readiness to have him join. Teal responded, stating that he had been actively searching for Guiyang with a full awareness and willingness to face the risk of death. As they poured the wine, they raised their bowls in a toast, celebrating the beginning of their newfound partnership. Meanwhile, the boy, in another part of the village, was proclaiming that he was Guiyang. He attempted to persuade his sister to support his claim, seeking her endorsement of his declaration. The servant noticed the commotion and informed that the majesty had arrived upon hearing the noise outside. 
He informed the majesty that the boy was claiming to be Guiyang. Moreover, not just him, but a group of people had gathered at the palace, all making the bold claim that they were Guiyang. The situation escalated into a fight as people competed to assert that they were Guiyang. It appeared that they were doing so because they knew that claiming to be Guiyang could lead to being awarded a jade plaque. The majesty considered them to be ordinary individuals and asked his servant whether he believed that one of them could truly be Guiyang. Suddenly, the real Guiyang arrived, and Teal was clearing the path for him. In response, the majesty felt anxious due to Guiyang's sudden arrival. Teal explained that he had come after hearing that they were searching for Guiyang. He then presented Guiyang to the majesty. However, one of the villagers, fueled by anger, demanded evidence to prove that Guiyang was indeed the real one. Teal smirked as the man confidently declared that he was Guiyang. The man, taken aback, was puzzled and questioned what Teal meant, expressing his confusion that he couldn't discern anything significant about Gui. The majesty confronted Gui and directly asked him if he was the real Gui. Suddenly, Gui stepped forward, indicating his intention to address the majesty and ask a question. He sought clarification, asking if the goal of organizing the king's bodyguards was to form a special force for the purpose of subjugating the barbarian. The majesty continued to listen attentively to what Gui was saying. Guiyang remarked that, just like the jurchen who tried to present a positive image, he was curious about what actions the king of their nation had taken. He continued, expressing his belief that the root cause of their problems could be attributed to the king's negligence in addressing the issues at hand. The majesty acknowledged that Guiyang wasn't entirely wrong and questioned whether he intended to shirk the responsibility of correcting the past. He continued, emphasizing that irrespective of the past, the present actions were crucial and Joseon had not forsaken the northern region. Guiyang, angered, demanded that if the majesty wanted to discuss matters concerning their nation, he should bring the king directly. Teal attempted to calm Guiyang in response. They were taken aback when the majesty revealed that this was precisely the reason he had been conversing with Guiyang. He then declared that he was, in fact, speaking on his own lips. This revelation left Teal in shock. His servant, too, fell silent in response to this unexpected statement. The villagers were shocked and surprised to learn that the man standing before them was, in fact, the king. Upon realizing the true identity of the king, they all bowed their heads in a display of respect and reverence. They all came to the realization that he was Sejong Yidu, the fourth king of Joseon. However, Guiyang remained standing, showing a level of resolve or perhaps reluctance to immediately conform to the formalities. Teal attempted to convince Guiyang to kneel in acknowledgement of the king, likely understanding the protocol and customary expectations. Suddenly, a person arrived and mentioned that she had come after seeing the notice. She claimed to have personally seen Guiyang. The guard asked her if it was true, and she confirmed the veracity of her statement. As she was recounting how Guiyang had saved her life, she suddenly appeared shocked or startled. Observing her sudden reaction, the king became curious and wondered about the cause of her distress. In an abrupt moment, the woman swiftly descended to the ground, visibly shocked and taken by surprise. Following the incident, she proceeded to assert that the man standing before her was the barbarian, expressing bewilderment about his unexpected presence in that particular location. Filled with terror, the woman recounted that she had unmistakably witnessed the man in question associating with the barbarian. She conveyed that the man was actively tearing apart and mercilessly killing people from Josie. Out of the blue, he seized Teal's face. Following that, he remarked that the woman was indeed fortunate to have encountered Guiyang. With a sinister tone, he wickedly declared that Guiyang alone wasn't the issue. The king was taken aback when the man they initially believed to be Guiyang announced his intention to kill him that very day and expressed his determination to unify Jurchen. Subsequently, the man proceeded to deliver a punch to Teal's face. He reiterated his earlier warning, reminding him that he had forewarned of the possibility of his demise because of him. At that moment, a villager was on the verge of striking him from behind. However, he was effortlessly halted as the man swiftly intercepted pressing his weapon against the would-be assailant's face. Without mercy, he ruthlessly struck the villager with the weapon. The king and his servant were surprised on what he did. As a result of the attack, the man's face was damaged severely. Moreover, after hitting the man's face, the barbarian proceeds to hit the man down to the ground. Short after, he quickly went to attack the other people in the vicinity. However, the villagers didn't get scared and tried to attack him at once. The villagers decided to attack the barbarian altogether and leave him no room to escape. But as they were advancing, the barbarian easily held the man's face with his one hand and gripped it. Even if he was outnumbered, he easily took down the villagers. While he was occupied with the men in front, one of the men went and stabbed him from behind. However, the man was surprised. The barbarian didn't show any pain as he stabbed him. As a result, the barbarian quickly killed the man. Amidst the chaos, Teal lay on the ground, 
pondering what had gone awry. Regret filled his thoughts as he berated himself for his perceived foolishness, realizing that he had failed to discern the true intentions and identity of the man. Regret weighed heavily on him as he lamented the realization that the spirits residing within the man were all vengeful entities from the people of Josian. The guard and servant hurriedly moved to evacuate, intent on swiftly removing the king from the imminent danger. With remarkable speed, the barbarian was charging towards them, intensifying the urgency of their escape. Out of nowhere, a man borrowed the spear from one of the terrified guards. Meanwhile, the barbarian was on the verge of launching an assault on the king. The king, shocked and with nowhere to run, found himself in a dire predicament. In a sudden turn of events, a spear struck the barbarian from the side, forcing him to halt his attack on the king. Suddenly, a swift and decisive move was executed by an individual who quickly lunged forward, about to deliver a powerful kick to the barbarian. To their astonishment, it turned out to be the same boy from earlier, making their surprise even more profound. With a powerful and swift motion, he plunged the weapon and kicked it forcefully into the barbarian's body. The barbarian, caught off guard, stunned by the unexpected counterattack. Nevertheless, despite the surprise, he mustered the strength to retaliate and attempted to grip onto the boy's face. Fueled by anger, the barbarian persisted, but the boy held firm, maintaining a tight grip on the weapon lodged in his body. A piercing scream escaped the barbarian's lips as the boy forcefully thrust the weapon. The king, in a state of surprise, recognized the child. In a bold move, the boy removed his cloth, revealing his identity to the king, and emphatically expressed how many times he had tried to convey his true identity to the monarch. After revealing himself, the boy stood firm. Tio caught sight of him and, in a moment of realization, recognized that it was indeed the same person. The boy then asserted that he was, in fact, the real Guion. The scene was shrouded in a moment of hushed stillness as the revelation unfolded. In agony, the barbarian clutched the weapon embedded in his body. Following that, he questioned the boy before him, seeking confirmation on whether he truly was the genuine Guion, as he asserted. Guion asserted his authenticity, declaring himself as the genuine one, and proceeded to expose the other individual as the imposter. Upon hearing this revelation, the king found himself taken aback, deep in contemplation as he tried to make sense of the unfolding situation. The barbarian shattered the weapon embedded in him and made a determined effort to rise to his feet. He conveyed to Guiyang that he was an enemy of the Jurchen, emphasizing that his sole purpose for being there was to eliminate him. Nevertheless, as he spoke, Guiyang swiftly delivered a punch, interrupting his words. The swiftness of the attack caught him off guard, leaving him genuinely surprised by its speed. Shortly after, Guiyang prepared to unleash a potent kick. Caught off guard by the kick, the barbarian, already stunned, was unable to evade it, intensifying the pain due to his existing wound. The force of the kick caused the barbarian to take a step backward, momentarily staggered by the impact. Following the step backward, he directed his gaze towards the king, locking eyes with him. The king was taken aback, surprised by the unexpected moment of locking eyes with the barbarian. Suddenly, the barbarian shifted his focus and charged at the king. In a protective instinct, the servant hurriedly moved to shield the king from the impending threat. However, a man swiftly came between them, readying to confront the barbarian and engage in a clash. The barbarian was taken aback as the man swiftly brandished his weapon. He struck the barbarian forcefully in the chest, eliciting a scream of pain from the wounded warrior. The man, having subdued the barbarian momentarily, inquired about the situation, questioning whether the barbarian was responsible for the chaos in the palace grounds. The elderly servant, expressing his frustration, addressed the man known as Lee Sunday to Monday, remarking that his arrival was late. The servant insisted to the king that they shouldn't let him off the hook. However, the king, addressing Sunday to Monday, declared that he mustn't be killed. The king informed Sunday to Monday that there were matters the barbarian needed to clarify, advising against taking his life immediately. As Sunday to Monday halted and obeyed the king, a wooden object pierced through the barbarian. This turn of events left both Sunday to Monday and the barbarian visibly surprised by the unexpected occurrence. Shortly after, Guiyang swiftly launched an attack on the barbarian, landing a forceful blow to his face. Continuing his assault, Guiyang relentlessly delivered powerful blows. He was overwhelming the barbarian with the force of his attacks. With a relentless barrage of punches, Guiyang seemed determined to kill him. Consumed by anger, Guiyang was entirely enveloped in the singular thought of putting an end to the barbarian's life. The king and his servant watched in astonishment as Guiyang unleashed a merciless assault, taken aback by the intensity of his actions. However, in the midst of his relentless attack, Guiyang's fist was abruptly halted by another force. Sunday to Mondag intervened, putting a stop to Guiyang's assault, and reminded him that the king had ordered to spare the barbarian's life. Guiyang then pointed out if Sunday to Mondag witnessed the barbarian's ruthless actions, 
and questioned whether sparing his life was justified given the brutality he had unleashed. He emphasized the ordeal the people had endured due to the barbarians' actions, demanding to know what kind of suffering they had been subjected to. The barbarian's face was marred and unrecognizable due to the multiple punches, yet Guiyang remained fueled by anger at the notion that their people had been mercilessly slaughtered. He emphasized the contradiction in sparing the lives of those who had caused so much harm, questioning how they could advocate for mercy in such a situation. Suddenly, someone seized him from behind and addressed him as brother. His sister held on to him, embracing him tightly, and pleaded with him to stop the violence, insisting that it had gone far enough. In a desperate plea, she screamed at him, urging him to stop, expressing how frightened she was by the escalating situation. Suddenly, the king was taken aback by this unexpected turn of events. Guiyang, in a sudden and unexpected move, knelt before the king. As Guiyang knelt before the king, he pleaded for a chance to serve and be utilized as the king saw fit. He earnestly requested that the king grant his sister an opportunity to embark on a new life. The king inquired whether Guiyang's plea and willingness to serve were solely driven by his concern for his sister. Guiyang simply stated that, given the challenging circumstances, his main wish was for his sister to have the opportunity to live a normal life. He was taken aback when the king expressed his disapproval of the request. In response to the king's disapproval, he inquired about the reasons behind his decision. The king clarified that he disapproved of Guiyang joining his ranks primarily because of his sister's influence, expressing reservations about such a motive. Subsequently, Sunday to Mondag called Guiyang out to address him. Sunday to Mondag advised him to give up and instead be grateful for his continued existence, considering the audacity displayed through his disobedience. His sister comforted him, saying it was okay, and proposed they should just go back. Afterward, they departed from the palace in silence, without exchanging any words. Furthermore, Sunday to Mondag inquired of the king why he hadn't conveyed to Guiyang what he intended to share. In reply, the king, gazing at the sky, expressed that it felt too shameless to disclose. Shortly after, night descended, and the moon made its appearance. Guiyang and his sister strolled silently over the snow-covered landscape. His sister turned to him and straightforwardly stated that she wouldn't let him do whatever he pleased. She expressed her concern about being brought into a noble house by selling himself, and emphasized her reluctance to go through such a path alone. When his brother inquired about her blunt statement, his sister explained that she would be open to the idea if he joined her in that endeavor. He then revealed that after the barbarians had killed their parents five years ago, he had made a promise with their father. He pledged to protect her no matter what, assuring her not to worry about him. His sister smiled and remarked that he had been protecting her for a long time. She expressed gratitude for having him by her side. Suddenly, a swift weapon darted directly towards her, narrowly passing by Guiyang as he spoke. He was taken aback by the sudden attack. A sense of shock gripped him as his sister was pierced by an arrow near her heart, leaving both of them in stunned disbelief. Swiftly, he rushed to her aid. The barbarians, who were behind him, missed hitting him but accidentally struck his sister instead. They continued to reveal themselves and explained that, thanks to Mackin, the barbarian he had killed, they were able to track him down. As he held his sister on his arms, the barbarians surrounded him. Dong Yi, his sister, looked at him in pain and called him brother. Turns out, she was telling her brother to look out from behind him as one of the barbarians was about to strike him. Suddenly, Sunday to Mondag arrived at the right timing and stopped the attack. He asked Guiyang what's the situation, while Guiyang was panicking about his sister. Subsequently, Dong Yi trembled in pain while she cried. She called her brother and told him that he was okay. However, as she was speaking and telling him that she was fine, she suddenly started to close her eyes slowly. One of the barbarians quickly moved and wielded his weapon against Sunday to Monday. But Sunday to Monday didn't panic and remained calm despite the upcoming attack. Quickly, he sliced the barbarian into pieces with just one wield of his sword. Upon slicing him into pieces, Sunday to Mondag remained steadfast and calm. Witnessing one of their comrades swiftly sliced into pieces, they were overcome with shock and terror. Sunday to Mondag quickly turned and attempted to get Guiyang's attention, urging him to snap out of it and come to his senses. He cradled his sister in his arms, gently caressing her, only to come to the heartbreaking realization that she was now lifeless. Panic spread among the barbarians as they were well aware of Lee Sunday to Mondag and his formidable swordsmanship. Fearing the prowess of Lee Sunday to Monday, they hastily fled, their fear propelling them to escape as swiftly as possible. Guiyang gently laid his sister down, a heavy sorrow weighing on him as he prepared to face the aftermath of the sudden and tragic turn of events. Swiftly, he rose to his feet and retrieved his weapon. Sunday to Monday, observing his actions, inquired about his intentions, asking what he was about to do. Filled with wrath, he harbored a burning desire to exact vengeance and eliminate every last one of the barbarians responsible for his sister's death. 
With determination fueling his every step, he swiftly ran after the fleeing barbarians. Sunday to Mondag observed him with a solemn gaze, understanding the storm of emotions and purpose that drove Guiyang in that moment. While Guiyang pursued with a vengeance, the barbarians continued their frantic escape. In the midst of their escape, one of the barbarians pondered aloud why Sunday to Mondag was present in the northern region. Unbeknownst to the questioning barbarian, Guiyang was silently closing in from behind. Swiftly and decisively, Guiyang executed a precise strike, severing the arm of the barbarian and leaving them stunned. The severed arm fell to the ground. Filled with wrath, Guiyang, pointing at the severed arm, declared that it was the very hand that had wielded the bow against his sister. Undeterred, the barbarian attempted to retaliate, but Guiyang, prepared and fueled by determination, swiftly moved to slice off the other hand. As the hand fell to the ground, Guiyang grimly stated that it was the very hand that had pulled the bowstring. Quickly, he delivered a powerful punch to the barbarian's abdomen. As the barbarian crumpled to the ground, he pointed his sword threateningly at the barbarian's eyes. As he pointed the sword at the barbarian's eye, he uttered with conviction that it was the very eye that had aimed at his sister. Guiyang gazed at the fallen barbarian with tears streaming down his eyes. In the midst of the charged atmosphere, a gruesome act unfolded. Meanwhile, the king, accompanied by his guards, roamed the forest in search of Guiyang. The king inquired of Sunday to Mondag whether Guiyang had passed through that path. Sunday to Mondag confirmed that Guiyang had indeed gone after the enemy with determined purpose. Shortly after their conversation, the king spotted him, his figure emerging from the shadows of the forest. Walking towards them, Guiyang embodied the nickname Ghost Shadow, a testament to his stealth and formidable presence. His eyes were devoid of emotion, an emptiness reflecting the profound grief and anger within him. Suddenly, he was taken aback by an unexpected sight, a momentary shock registering on his expression. In a surprising turn of events, Guiyang's shock intensified as he discovered that his sister was alive and in the company of the king. Without hesitation, they swiftly ran towards each other, a reunion marked by relief, disbelief, and the overwhelming joy of finding one another alive. His brother stood there, unable to believe his eyes, as the realization slowly dawned on him that she was indeed alive. Nevertheless, the king's expression bore an unusual quality as he observed the reunion. The king, with a measured tone, inquired whether Guiyang was genuinely happy to see his sister alive. Abruptly, the king produced and brandished his weapon, leaving Guiyang astonished and uncertain about the intentions behind this unexpected action. Out of nowhere, the king viciously struck Guiyang's sister from behind. His sister writhed in agony, the sudden and brutal attack leaving her in excruciating pain. Despite the anguish and suffering of Guiyang's sister, the king stood resolute, showing no signs of remorse. Enraged, Guiyang confronted the king questioning the motives behind this inexplicable and cruel action. His surprise deepened as the king nonchalantly stated that his sister would revive regardless, introducing a mysterious element to the unfolding situation. The king raised his voice, commanding him to think. The king then revealed that during the Jurchen invasion five years ago, he was the sole survivor. Moreover, the king disclosed that Guiyang's sister had perished on that fateful day during the Jurchen invasion. Stunned and in shock, he grappled with the revelation that what he held onto as his sister was, in fact, nothing more than an illusion. He found himself in a state of astonishment, unsure of how to react, struggling to comprehend the reality of what had just transpired. In a panic, he frantically scanned his surroundings, desperately searching for his sister, only to come to the harsh realization that she had been nothing more than a figment of his imagination all along. The king then spoke, mentioning that he had heard rumors about him, all of which aligned with what had just been conveyed. People thought Guiyang couldn't handle losing his sister to the barbarians, seeing him as a troubled child who had lost his grip on reality. Upon hearing this, Guiyang became infuriated, dismissing the claims as utter nonsense. He countered by stating that others had witnessed him with his sister as well. He asserted that there were sightings of them in the village and even at the government office. As he reminisced about those moments, he continued to emphasize that everyone had seen him with his sister. He went a step further, passionately urging Sunday to Mondag to believe his account of events. However, Sunday to Mondag revealed that throughout that period, Guiyang had been alone. Even during the scenes where he appeared to be arguing with his sister, Sunday to Mondag disclosed that Guiyang was actually alone, engaged in a conversation with himself. The king, too, observed instances where Guiyang was talking to himself. Furthermore, when the barbarians attacked, they were perplexed by his erratic behavior, questioning why he was talking to himself and displaying signs of madness. Even Sunday to Mondag had wondered earlier about his actions, questioning what he was up to. He was shocked to learn the truth, that his sister, Dongyi, had never been there with him. Returning to the moment when his father faced imminent danger, he entrusted Dongyi to him, urging him to protect her. He covered his sister's mouth to prevent her from making any noise while they were hiding from the barbarians. 
Upon his father's death, he directed his gaze towards the figure responsible for his father's demise. In that moment, he restrained himself but couldn't help but take a closer look. He observed a man exuding a dark aura, unable to discern the finer details of his appearance. Shortly after, they managed to escape, and he sprinted away, carrying his sister on his back. Panting heavily, he continued running, tears still streaming down his eyes. Despite his exhaustion, he remained determined not to let the barbarians catch them. Suddenly, a man appeared in front of them. Turns out, it was their grandfather, Kang. His grandfather was also surprised to see him. His grandfather quickly approached, delighted to see them alive. But he observed that only Guiyang and his sister were present. Consequently, he inquired whether their parents had managed to escape the village. Guiyang couldn't hold back his tears as he recounted how the barbarians had forcibly taken their mother and cruelly ended their father's life. Just as he was about to delve into the further hardships they endured, their grandpa embraced Guiyang, reassuring him that everything was okay now that they, at least, had made it out alive. However, their grandfather noticed that an arrow was lodged in Dongyi's back. The sight both surprised and deeply concerned him. Swiftly, Guiyang brought Dongyi to the ground. She was breathing heavily. In a state of tremor and panic, he found himself at a loss, unsure of what actions to take. His grandpa quickly warned him against attempting to remove the arrow. Surprise washed over Guiyang as his grandfather informed him that there was a boat nearby, ready and waiting. If they could board it, they could make their way to the next village. However, right as his grandfather was speaking, a sudden shock silenced him as an arrow pierced through his head. Guiyang swiftly turned to identify the source of the arrow. As he turned, Guiyang witnessed the barbarians closing in on him. The leader, mounted on a horse, was the one who had fired the arrow. Acting swiftly, he carried his sister onto his back. With his sister on his back, Guiyang sprinted away in an attempt to escape, leaving behind his grandfather who had been fatally struck. The barbarian leader swiftly commanded his men to pursue Guiyang and his sister. Shortly after, Guiyang and Dongyi managed to board the boat that their grandfather had mentioned and swiftly set sail on their journey. As he paddled, Guiyang turned to his sister, who was calling out to him and breathing heavily. His sister was already on the verge of dying. On the other hand, the barbarians witnessed the two children leaving on the boat. Frustration set in as they realized they had lost their chance and it was too late to catch them. Just as it seemed they might let them escape, their leader intervened and ordered them to shoot a flaming arrow at the boat. He instructed them to eliminate any possibility of escape and to shoot a fire arrow without hesitation. As Guiying paddled fervently, an arrow struck the boat. He witnessed a flaming arrow suddenly embed itself in the boat. Panting heavily, he glanced upward, only to be filled with surprise as an unexpected situation unfolded. His eyes widened as he observed numerous flaming arrows descending towards their boat from above. Reacting swiftly, he rushed to his sister's side, seeking to shield her from the impending danger. However, in the midst of the chaos, they lost their balance, and the boat abruptly overturned. As a consequence, both of them plunged into the water. He screamed his sister's name, struggling to stay afloat and avoid drowning in the water. Quickly thinking on his feet, he decided to dive beneath the water. He dove deep into the water, frantically attempting to reach his sister who was sinking even farther beneath the surface. However, a wave of dismay and shock overcame him as he beheld his sister's face and her dire situation. His sister's eyes were nearly lifeless, devoid of hope, and she was visibly struggling, indicating the bleakness of her survival prospects. As she sank deeper, she began to slowly close her eyes, a poignant sign of the impending tragedy. As Guiyang recollected this painful memory of his sister, he screamed in shock and anguish. The air resonated with the sounds of pain and frustration as he screamed, the emotions enveloping him in a torrent of despair. Unable to fathom the reality of his sister's death, he found himself on the brink of losing all sense of composure once again. The king and his right-hand man exchanged concerned glances as they observed Guiyang. The king approached Guiyang with a measured pace, offering a heartfelt apology for the failure to protect his family and village. He urged Guiyang to place the blame on him and on the nation for their perceived inaction. Tears streamed down Guiyang's face, and a mixture of emotions overwhelmed him as the king encouraged him to release the burden of guilt for not being able to protect his family. Afterwards, Guiyang glanced to his side, and to his amazement, an illusion of his sister appeared once more, calling him brother. His sister extended her hand and inquired if he was in a lot of pain. Tears cascaded from his eyes, and he was overcome with overwhelming emotions. He extended his hand and tenderly touched his sister's face. A bittersweet smile crossed his face as he awkwardly realized that, since that gruesome day, his sister hadn't grown up. His sister's eyes welled up with tears as she affectionately called him brother. Gradually, she began to fade away, expressing gratitude to him as she vanished. She started to vanish, leaving Guiyang alone. His hands trembled as he came to the painful realization that his sister was truly gone. 
He cried helplessly in front of the king, who silently observed his grief with a heavy heart. He continued to cry inconsolably, his heart burdened with the heavy reality that his sister was truly gone. The weight of sorrow was palpable in the air. The king gazed at him intently, a deep concern etched on his face. Subsequently, he placed a comforting hand on Guiyang's head and expressed that if he could let go of his resentment and hatred, choosing to live an ordinary life, the king promised to make it happen. The king knelt down and conveyed that if Guiyang chose to spend the rest of his life hunting barbarians like a butcher, then he would strive to open up a better path for him. He went on to explain that there was a prestigious organization called the Northern Spearhead, specifically created to confront the Jurchens, known as the Informer. The king asked Guiyang if he would consider becoming an Informer, channeling his rage to protect the nation and its people. Although he acknowledged it as a shameless request, the king sincerely presented the option to him. The king's curiosity was piqued when Guiyang inquired if he could find out a specific man. Guiyang clarified that he vividly remembered the person responsible, the one who had set their village ablaze. He revealed that this man was the one who had ruthlessly killed his family. Guiyang's expression turned resolute as he contemplated thoughts of the man who had caused so much pain. The king, in turn, observed him in solemn silence. Shortly afterward, the king handed Guiyang a jade plaque and instructed him to accept it. Guiyang examined the plaque attentively as the king explained that he should carry it once winter passed. The king mentioned that when the royal procession was recruiting, if Guiyang held the plaque, he would be able to reach him immediately. The king rose to his feet and declared that in that very moment, he would officially become an informer. Following that incident, Guiyang is preparing to have a meal on the other day. And at this moment, his order of chicken and soup has just been served. A wave of happiness swept over him, and he couldn't help but feel a sense of delight. Saliva began to escape from his mouth as he gazed at the tempting spread of food laid out before him. Without wasting any time, he swiftly grabbed a piece of chicken. Suddenly, he extended the chicken towards his sister, attempting to offer it to her. However, he quickly realized that his sister was no longer by his side. A profound silence enveloped him as he came to the realization that his sister is gone. The weight of her absence settled in, casting a somber atmosphere. Out of nowhere, someone swiftly snatched the chicken from his grasp. General Sunday to Mondag took a seat beside him and inquired about his well-being, asking how he was holding up. His sudden appearance caught him off guard, leaving him surprised and slightly taken aback. The general ordered a drink and informed Guiyang that there was no alcohol on his table. Shortly afterward, he turned his gaze towards Guiyang, observing him closely. Guiyang was suddenly taken aback when Sunday to Mondag asked if he could still see his sister. Guiyang responded, expressing that he could no longer see his sister. As they conversed, their drinks were served. Sunday to Mondag poured a drink, visibly relieved by his response. In a gesture of camaraderie, Sunday to Mondag offered Guiyang a drink, explaining that sending off his sister marked Guiyang's first step into adulthood. Despite the offer, Guiyang hesitated to take a sip. Curious, Guiyang inquired about the reason someone of Sunday to Mondag's stature was paying attention to someone like him. Sunday to Mondag explained that he found him interesting, which led to his interest in him. Furthermore, he revealed that it was at the behest of the king that he had discovered more about him. Continuing his explanation, Sunday to Mondag remarked that Guiyang's ability to take lives at such a young age and the numerous records associated with his name were what made him particularly intriguing. Sunday to Mondag expressed amazement at how Guiyang's ghost shadow name had been uncovered, highlighting the mystique surrounding Guiyang's identity. However, Sunday to Mondag was taken by surprise when Guiyang began saying something unexpected. Suddenly, Guiyang revealed that Guai Hanya meant precious and Young Hanya meant welcome. He disclosed that these were his real names, leaving Sunday to Mondag taken aback by the unexpected revelation. In response to Guiyang's revelation, Sunday to Mondag poured another drink and offered an apology, admitting that it was his nature not to delve deeply into his initial assumptions. A mixture of emotions overcame him as Sunday to Mondag conveyed that whatever he chose to do in the future would be a journey to cleanse his past and pave the way for a new path forward. Acknowledging the gravity of the moment, Sunday to Mondag extended a drink to him, proposing a toast to celebrate the beginning of his new life. Guiyang gazed at the drink, a myriad of thoughts swirling in his mind, contemplating the significance of the moment and the path that lay ahead. After a moment of contemplation, he smiled and agreed to join in, ready to embrace the new chapter that awaited him. With a decisive move, he quickly drank the wine, symbolizing a symbolic initiation into the journey that lay ahead in his new life. Sunday to Mondag turned his gaze toward Guiyang. He was surprised to find Guiyang asleep after consuming just one bowl of the drink. Standing up, Sunday to Mondag smirked, contemplating the situation with a realization that Guiyang, despite his prowess, had not fully embraced the experiences of adulthood. 
Sunday to Monday, with a determined purpose, began searching through Guiyang's belongings. Not finding what he saw in the initial search, he persisted and delved into Guiyang's clothes. Upon discovering what he was searching for, a triumphant smile adorned Sunday to Mondag's face. With a sense of accomplishment, Sunday to Mondag finally held the jade plaque in his hands, the sought-after item that had driven his search through Guiyang's belongings. Having secured the jade plaque, he discreetly left him and carefully concealed the precious item, ensuring its secrecy and protection. Before departing, he turned for a final glance at Gui and remarked that things aren't interesting if they're too easy. He advised him to have some fun, injecting a hint of mischief into his parting words. Departing from the scene, he left a piece of advice for those around, suggesting they refrain from waking him and let him continue his peaceful slumber. Shortly after Sunday to Mondag's departure, the night descended, and the moon cast its gentle glow, illuminating the surroundings with its soft, silvery light. Guiyan woke up, feeling a sense of surprise and lingering dizziness from his earlier indulgence. Attempting to sit up, Guiyan, still grappling with dizziness, pondered the moment he had fallen asleep and the transition into the night that had occurred in his unconscious state. Curiosity filled his thoughts as he wondered whether General Lee Sunday to Mondag had departed in his absence. Recollections of General Lee Sunday to Mondag's words about moving forward onto a new path echoed in Guiyan's mind as he grappled with the aftermath of the night's events. Empowered by the resolve to move forward, he felt a newfound determination, recognizing that what had transpired was merely the beginning of his journey. As he surveyed his surroundings, Guiyan contemplated the notion that the recruitment for the royal forces had commenced, possibly signaling a shift in the dynamics of his world. In the quiet moments of reflection, he recalled the king's words about his role as an informer. Focusing on the task at hand, he endeavored to retrieve the jade plaque from his clothes. A surge of surprise and shock swept through him as he realized that the jade plaque, once securely hidden, was now nowhere to be found. Caught in a frenzy of searching, he drew the attention of onlookers as he frantically tossed aside belongings, desperately attempting to locate the elusive jade plaque. A sinking realization dawned on him as he acknowledged that the jade plaque, a gift from the king, was gone. As time passed, the day of the recruitment arrived, and the proceedings unfolded high up in the mountains setting the stage for a significant event in Guiyang's life. A multitude of people had gathered for the recruitment, creating a bustling atmosphere as individuals from various walks of life assembled in anticipation of what the day held for them. Among the crowd, eyes turned towards Guiyang, and a sense of disbelief rippled through the onlookers as they observed a child like him applying for recruitment. While the crowd buzzed with activity, he remained lost in his thoughts as the absence of the jade plaque weighing heavily on his mind. Shortly after, the recruitment process progressed, and individuals began stepping forward to announce their names. The man conducting the recruitment was visibly surprised, perhaps taken aback by the unexpected presence of a young participant. Guiyang, explaining his situation to the old man, mentioned the lost jade plaque. The man, shocked by the revelation and considering Guiyang's age, inquired about the origin of the precious item and how a child like him came to possess it. A smile graced Guiyang's face as he disclosed to the man that the jade plaque was a gift from the king himself. Following Guiyang's revelation about the king's gift, a hushed silence descended upon the gathering. Perceiving Guiyang's statement as incredulous, the old man deemed him to be possibly delusional, and instructed the guards to escort him out, dismissing the notion of the king's gift as seemingly absurd. Shortly after, the proctor in charge of the Northern Royal Forces recruitment introduced himself as Kim Jang, outlining the position he held in the proceedings. Kim Jang, in his announcement, revealed that the selection standards were stricter than previously known. However, he countered this with the promise of exceptional benefits and wages for those fortunate enough to be chosen for the recruitment. Emphasizing the gravity of the endeavor, he added that the recruitment wasn't something achievable through mere luck or superficial skills. The crowd's attention shifted to Guiyang after Kim Jang's remark about the unsuitability of someone who claimed to lose a jade plaque. This statement took Guiyang by surprise, as the judgment seemed to be directed at him. Furthermore, he proceeded to explain the details of the first test. He pointed to the mountaintop, announcing that those who could retrieve the red feathered arrow from that lofty height would be deemed successful in the first test. Adding a layer of challenge, he disclosed that there are only 10 red feathered arrows for the 30 participants, implying that they needed to strategize and compete for the limited opportunities available. As the realization of the limited red feathered arrows sunk in, the recruits wasted no time and swiftly darted towards the mountain. Amidst the flurry of activity, Kim Jang keenly observed that one person wasn't partaking in the rapid ascent. Gui Yun, standing apart from the rushing crowd, admitted to Kim Jang that he was taken by surprise, offering an explanation for his delayed response to the unfolding events. Responding promptly to Kim Jang's instruction, 
Guiyang quickly joined the race. As Guiying sprinted alongside the others, he couldn't help but marvel at the audacity of a child like him daring to participate in the challenging recruitment. While navigating the path upwards, his thoughts drifted, and he found himself contemplating the mystery of how he had lost the jade plaque. Guiying ran, realizing that with only ten arrows available, securing the tenth position was vital. Falling far behind, he questioned if he could catch up. During his ascent, he was taken by surprise as a sight unfolded before him, capturing his attention along the way. He was surprised to witness participants strewn across the ground. Curious about the sudden commotion and unaware of the impending threat, he wondered what had happened. Little did he know, someone was poised to strike him from behind. Reacting with swift agility, he managed to dodge the impending attack, narrowly evading the strike aimed at him from behind. The group of men, witnessing Guiyang's nimble evasion, was collectively surprised by his ability to avoid the attack with such speed. One of the men, adopting a sarcastic tone, remarked that while there were ten red-feathered arrows, the proctor hadn't mentioned if there would be the same number of passes. The man straightforwardly declared their intention to knock out and steal arrows from others descending the mountain, intensifying the competitive and cutthroat nature of the recruitment process. Hearing the ruthless strategy, Guiyang couldn't believe the audacity of those men, registering his surprise at the cutthroat tactics being proposed. Reacting to the imminent threat, one of the men charged at him, brandishing a weapon with the clear intention of targeting him. To their astonishment, the man attacking him was taken by surprise as Guiyang managed to disarm him, swiftly turning the tables in a display of unexpected prowess. In a sudden twist, the momentum shifted, and the disarmed man found himself in the path of his own weapon. Capitalizing on the opportunity, Guiying struck the weapon against the man's head, delivering a decisive counterattack in the escalating confrontation. As Guiying struck the man, he spoke and inquired. Wearing a smile, Guiying asked the man how they had come up with such a cunning and ruthless strategy. Once the man was struck on the head, he immediately experienced a sudden onset of dizziness, causing him to fall. The members of his group were taken aback when they realized that their fellow comrade had been struck by a child. He found it hard to believe that he had been hit by nothing more than a child. Fueled by anger at Guiyang's insult, he instructed his group to charge all at once. Meanwhile, a supervisor is positioned above, carefully observing the participants as they run. Lee Sunday to Mondeg approached General Choi, who was also keeping a close watch on the events unfolding. The general inquired why Yi Soon Mong stood beside him and suggested he move to the other side. Meanwhile, Sunday to Mondeg simply ignored him. The general explained to him, emphasizing that people had no alternative but to join. He highlighted the advantage of swiftly completing their military service, coupled with the opportunity for individuals from lower social classes to avoid the burden of concealing their identity. The general informed him that the king was genuinely committed to implementing informers this time. Subsequently, Sunday to Mondeg made a concerted effort to closely observe the participants, specifically attempting to identify Guiyang among them. The general inquired if Sunday to Mondeg was referring to the boy who had been personally honored with a jade plaque by the king. He suggested that if Guiyang had one, they might be gathered elsewhere. Sunday to Mondeg, however, explained that certain circumstances compelled Guiyang to participate in the test personally. The general then disclosed that, from the beginning, he found the idea of awarding a jade plaque to a child quite absurd. He pointed out that informers constituted the most elite intelligence unit operating in the northern region. He thought the child with the jade plaque might feel he doesn't deserve it. Nevertheless, Sunday to Mondeg countered asserting that Guiyang was exceptional and possessed unique abilities. Yet, his prowess wasn't limited to just one aspect. He elaborated, noting that at the tender age of 12, Guiyang had actively sought out pillaging sites and demonstrated the capability to defeat barbarian. The general listened attentively as Sunday to Mondeg emphasized that true effectiveness comes from actual battle experience. He added, stating that if natural talent is layered on top of that experience, he remarked that Guiyang possessed a heaven-sent talent. On the flip side, Guiyang was actively engaged in combat with some of the other participants. While in the midst of his fight with one opponent, Guiyang sensed another participant about to strike from behind. Swiftly dodging the attack, Guiyang managed to evade the strike, causing the assailant to inadvertently hit another man instead. Consequently, the bald man felt unconscious due to the unintended blow. Quickly, he delivered a swift kick to the man's private parts. The kick caused the man to wince in pain tears welling up in his eyes. Shortly after, another participant was gearing up to strike him. Unable to dodge the attack this time, the man's weapon broke upon striking Guiyang's face. However, the man was taken aback, surprised that Guiyang could still stand after enduring such a blow. Guiyang appeared somewhat peculiar after asserting that the man's strike didn't have much impact on him. On the contrary, the man sarcastically smiled and remarked that, 
Despite Guiyang's claim, it did indeed hurt. As the man prepared for another attack, Guiyang swiftly moved to counter the impending strike. Their leader was astonished to see his men getting knocked down. With his hand on his head, Guiyang remarked that rotten branches could hurt as much as they appeared to and could also serve as effective weapons. He retracted his earlier statements and conceded that both Guiyang and his comrade were indeed successful candidates. Guiyang responded by stating that it would be all for naught if he were the sole individual to pass. However, the man dismissed him as foolish, asserting that Guiyang couldn't handle the remaining challenges on his own. Persisting in his argument, the man displayed his muscles, emphasizing that victory was possible if they worked together. He questioned Guiyang, asking if his muscles appeared reliable. Guiyang pondered the man's proposition contemplating the idea of collaboration. The man inquired about Guiyang's name, to which he confirmed that his name was indeed Guiyang. Moreover, the man pondered for a moment, feeling like he had heard the name before. Extending his hand, the man asked Guiyang to become his associate. Shortly after, Dumak climbed up the tree and informed him that there wasn't a single person in sight. Subsequently, Guiyang found it strange and contemplated that those who had reached the mountain first should be returning promptly. Dumak suggested that something might have occurred emphasizing that they wouldn't know unless they ascended to the top to see for themselves. Guiyang agreed, acknowledging the validity of Dumak's suggestion. Descending from the tree, he recommended that they hasten their ascent before the sunset. However, as soon as he touched the ground, Guiyang was already in motion, running towards their destination. Dumak accepted the situation, thinking it was okay for Guiyang to proceed on his own since his own plans had been disrupted by their encounter. Surprisingly, Dumak found himself taken aback when Guiyang urged him to hasten and halted to wait for him. This left him shocked, realizing that Guiyang genuinely believed in the notion of being associates as he wanted him to come. Observing Guiyang as he ran, Dumak couldn't help but ponder that he truly couldn't understand him. He wondered how Guiyang had become so strong at such a young age. Nonetheless, Dumak couldn't shake the impression that Guiyang appeared a bit dull and naive despite his strength. So, Dumak thought he could use him as a powerful asset during the test. As the sun set, they were close to arrive at the tree. Ten arrows were embedded in the tree above, marking their path. Guiyang felt content that they had finally reached the top, while Dumak, on the other hand, was visibly exhausted. A man by the tree welcomed and inquired if they were the last participants to arrive. He questioned what petty tricks they had employed at the base of the mountain, leading them to only start climbing now. Dumak suddenly realized that there was a proctor at the top and understood why there had been so much chaos. Guiyang was taken aback, surprised to see that the man also possessed a jade plaque. The man inquired if Guiyang knew what the jade plaque was to be acting so welcoming. In response, Guiyang explained that he had also received a jade plaque, but due to losing it, he was facing the same challenges as the regular participants. The man stood up, realizing that Guiyang was the person being discussed, the one who had a jade plaque but lost it. Guiyang remained silent as the man asked if he understood the significance of possessing a jade plaque. The man explained that the jade plaque was a testament to being acknowledged by his majesty as the king's sword. He emphasized that it symbolized an achievement that someone of a lowly class like Guiyang shouldn't even dare to speak of. As Guiyang was about to speak, Dumak intervened, stating that the man's words were harsh. Continuing, Dumak remarked that judging from the man's haughty demeanor, he appeared to be a child from a Yongbin household. He asserted that the man should be aware of the special condition of the test, where they weren't checking one's social status. Dumak questioned why the man resorted to insulting words like lowly and crude, emphasizing that strength alone wasn't enough. Then, the man produced two wooden weapons. He instructed them to pick up the wooden weapons and wield them. The man then challenged both of them to come at him simultaneously, promising that if they succeeded, they would earn his acknowledgement by taking an arrow from him. Dumak grabbed one of the weapons and urged Guiying not to step up, emphasizing that this was a rare opportunity that wouldn't come around again. Without any hesitation, he charged at the man. However, the man skillfully dodged Dumak's attack. Yet, the man was taken by surprise as another attack was swiftly approaching, aimed at his head. Reacting swiftly, he intercepted the attack using his sword. Dumak grinned and inquired what the man thought of his swordsmanship. Continuing his assault, Dumak pressed on, infusing more force into his attacks. In response, the man simply took a breath, seemingly composed and unfazed. Dumak was taken aback when the man seemingly vanished into thin air swiftly dodging the attack. Suddenly, the man reappeared behind Dumok and remarked that he didn't have any expectations from the beginning, but it turned out as he anticipated. Taking advantage of Dumok's momentary distraction, the man struck from behind, catching him off guard. Just as Dumok was about to counterattack, the man targeted his leg. The strike on his leg caused Dumok to scream in pain as he knelt forcefully. 
Shortly after, the man directed his attention to Dumok's shoulders. The man continued his assault, stating that even if Dumok hailed from a humble origin, he should at least possess a decent character. Dumok found himself helpless, unable to do anything as he faced a relentless barrage of attacks. The man cruelly struck Dumok as he remarked that Dumok should be more careful, adding a touch of cruelty to his action. As the man continued his assault, Guiyang suddenly intervened, grabbing Dumok to shield him from further blows. Guiyang intervened, urging the man to stop and expressing that he was being excessively harsh. Continuing, he remarked that the situation didn't resemble a royal force selection, questioning if the man truly intended to go as far as killing Dumok. While he spoke, the man moved to grab him by the neck. Unexpectedly, the man lifted Guiyang onto his neck, taking him by surprise. Following the surprising lift, the man threw him to the ground. As he uttered something, the man prepared to deliver another blow. However, he realized that his weapon was no longer in his possession. Surprisingly, Guiyang managed to seize the man's weapon and presented it to him with a smile. Dumok then spoke about Guiyang's character. With confidence, Dumok stated that even if Guiyang seemed a bit unpolished, his skills were far from crude. Suddenly caught off guard, the man experienced a surprise when Guiyang targeted and struck his leg. The sudden attack left the man in shock and caused him to experience pain. Thank you for watching. If you like this story please comment next part. I hope you like our today's story. See you next time goodbye.